agree with you. I thought I, I would give you uh, a little bit of an update. First, just a few things uh, in terms of what's going on um, with the ministry, Himalayan life, um, and then, then we get into the word. Uh, I have a, a very simple message that I have on my heart, which, I, which has been a blessing to me, me as I've been reflecting, and I hope it is going to be a blessing to you. First of all, I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you um, for Himalayan life as an organization. Um, this is just, we're just coming to the end of our fiscal year. We run on a fiscal year from March 1st to February 28th. And you know what, 11 months ago when this whole pandemic started to break loose, um, there was huge question marks, right? And, and um, the question was, how, how will this all go, even financially? How, how is this going to work out with, with the crisis and the unemployment? Will we be able to continue our programs? Will we be able uh, to pay people their salaries? Um, and and um, the Lord has blessed us uh, in the sense, not in the sense that uh, uh, millions have dropped out of the sky. We don't need those either. But the Lord has blessed us. The ministry is going well after a period of, of having to shut down certain aspects, including some of our homes, including our school. We are now uh, back up on our feet um, and, and uh, the homes are open. We continue to look after orphans and street boys and, and increasingly also street girls, which is sad that we're seeing this happen. Um, we're seeing increased financial pressure on families in Asia as this whole pattern of migration work that has evolved over the last, I would say, 25 years or so. This has been disrupted. So there's hundreds of thousands of people who are out of work in, in uh, that part of the world. Um, it's, it, it's not going too well in that sense for many families. And that increased financial pressure in families uh, that, that has the unfortunate um, consequence that there's more pressure on kids and on education. Things that seem not so essential, they get, they get just dropped, such as girls' education, such as um, helping girls to grow up before they get married. So we're seeing more child marriages, more girls dropping out of school, and we're trying, um, as Ray said, to be true to our calling of helping families and particularly children on that journey from not life to life in a very holistic way, including uh, helping girls to complete their education, grow up in one of our homes uh, where uh, they have a healthy environment um, in a holistic sense to, to grow up and, and be nurtured and educated. Uh, also uh, get to know the Lord and love the Lord and live life and as it is our hope live life to the full as it has been intended by the lord for them so things are going um okay in that sense no shortage on challenges <laughs> uh, lots and lots of challenges uh, that which we always have and now there's maybe even more because of the pandemic thank you um as a church as an assembly for the financial help that you are giving us uh, to, to make it all happen. Um, I feel it's such a privilege to be in this position of, of um, having this ministry, of serving the Lord in our little neck of the woods and having people like yourselves behind us who, um, who share that vision. And it's not even our vision, right? It's a vision that we all get from, from uh, the pages of scripture, the vision of this kingdom that's that's growing and that's powerful and that's beautiful. And we all believe that one day it will come to, to its completion. We understand that we can't make it happen. Uh, we can make a contribution to the kingdom and one day it will have to come out of heaven. But um, somehow God honors uh, the work that you do, the work that we do, uh, how we build together in, in his kingdom of peace, love, Enjoy. So, thank you very much for journeying with us. The um the word that I have on my heart for today is a simple. It's a simple verse that I am sure all of you know. 
Um, I mean, I don't know you guys so well. We have met a few times. Um, probably almost all of you I'm seeing here um, on, on Zoom, I have met in person, maybe not quite all of you, but I don't know you well. So I don't know how well versed you are in scripture, but but I hope you are, and, and I trust you are. And so here it is, the verse for today. Um, it's from the book of Zechariah, um, the very well-known verse from chapter 4, verse 6, uh, which simply reads, and you know it, some of you could belt it out right away. Um, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by power, nor by might, but by the Spirit. Not by power, nor by might, but by his spirit. So my goal for this morning really is um, to reflect a bit on, on this verse, um, to take us into the period uh, of biblical history out of which that verse comes. Get, we, we get to meet the man to whom that verse has been given, that word has been given, Zerubbabel, um, and and well, uh, perhaps perhaps understand that that uh, word in a very personal way for yourself, for myself. That will be the plan for this morning. Is that is that an okay plan? Yeah, I, I'm seeing some heads nodding. I'm seeing a thumbs up. Thank you so much. And again, I wish we were in a sanctuary together where I actually can feel that you guys are with me because the truth is. I'm here in my little study, like most of the days, quite by myself. And, and yeah, I, they, they some perks, right? Because it's easier to have your coffee, but it's also much, much easier to be distracted. Right now, there's glass to this side, and my cat is outside scratching the glass, wanting to get in. There's so many ways we can be distracted as we're in our homes. I personally long for the day when we can go back into the sanctuary and leave behind that, that everyday aspect of our life and do Sabbath a little more, a little, a little more intentionally um, than, than it is possible right now. But that day will come. So, um, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit. Um, as I reflect on this, um, there's lots of memories. I was brought up in, in, a, in an assembly uh, in Switzerland. I think I've told you before. And, and I, actually, we were brought up in a, in a, very, in a very strict way. Um, as, as, a, as a boy, I didn't have the choice whether to go to church or not. There was simply that that was not a conversation topic whatsoever in our family. Um, we, we did go to church on Sundays and there was times in my in my childhood and youth when I was actually really interested uh, in what was going on and there was times when oh well when I was not so interested and and we had this we we always had um, teaching elders uh, from other assemblies come in and talk about whatever topic they had on their mind. We had we had those those preachers from faraway lands and missionaries who would come, and and there was just certain phrases that were dropped from time to time, either in their messages or in prayers. Phrases that would evoke quite quite a response in the assembly in in the congregation where when it was in a prayer then there's lots of amens or lots of sighs or if it was even in in a in, in a sermon you could see it was stirring people's hearts and emotions phrases such as uh, from sea to sea he shall have dominion and everybody goes amen um, or or phrases such as uh, um, he has been given a name above all names uh, or not by power nor by might but by my spirit and Honestly, to me, they were just phrases. We never seemed to really go and dig or, 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 or open up or put, put more context to those phrases. But something, there's something about them. I don't know whether this, this, this um, makes sense to you guys. That's just my, my own history. And so uh, with that particularly, particular phrase, not by power, that verse from scripture, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit. Um, 
I, I can definitely tell when I reflect back that there has always been a stirring in my own soul when I, when I hear that verse, but also a lack of understanding. So there we go. Let's dig in and see what's going on here. Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit. Um, this, this verse is given to Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel, well, that's a great name. I, I wish I was called something like Zerubbabel, eh? What a great name. I'm just Daniel. Who, who does that to their son? Eh? Yeah, 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 by the way, I really love my parents to pieces. They are great. I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit more uh, about them later on. But Daniel, God is my judge. That's, that's not such a fantastic name. Please don't do that to your children, Daniel. Um, Zerubbabel, however, that would be a great name. Just imagine in school, hey, Zerubbabel, what, what a fantastic name. So if we, if we uh, think about Zerubbabel, we obviously have to go and understand a little bit about his, uh, his context, uh, where we have to locate him in biblical history. I assume that your biblical history is, is pretty good, um, but, but I, I'll still give you some markers. Um, I think it's very important as we read scripture, as we as we um, try to understand different characters in scripture and the context of verses such as uh, not by power nor by might, that we understand into what kind of situation uh, the verse has been given. Um, in my own mind, I have I have just a few a few milestones in biblical history that help me to be clear which period I'm thinking about. Um, so, so, so the milestones, they go in 500 year um, steps. Hey? So I start at 2000 BC, 2000 before Christ. You got Abraham. That's really where the history of sal salvation in scripture starts with the promise given to Abraham and the calling to leave his, his land and, and the place of, of where he was living and to trust in the Lord and to be a, to be blessed and be a blessing and to promise that his descendants will be as stars in the sky and as sand uh, on the shore. Um, and then and then we uh, as we go over the next 500 years we see how Abraham's family starts working out that promise and, and the faith in their lives. And then 1500 before Christ. So 2000 before Christ, Abraham. 1500 before Christ, uh, we got Moses. So by now, that family is no longer in the promised land. They are in Egypt. They're enslaved. They've grown into a big nation. Um, at the time of the Exodus, we read in scripture about roughly 2 million people. Moses is taking two million people out of Egypt um, through the desert uh, towards the promised land. So that family that started uh, with, with Abraham and Sarah is now a nation of two million people. And you're very familiar with all those stories and um, how, how they make their way to the promised land, how they conquer the promised land and Jericho and I, and how they become a kingdom, how uh, Saul becomes their first king after things had kind of worked and kind of not worked so well uh, with, with the leadership of, 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 of prophets like Samuel and so on and the judges. Then they become a kingdom. And the big, the best king that Israel has obviously is David. That brings us to the third milestone, a thousand before Christ. So 2000, Abraham, 1500, Moses. Uh, and now we're at 1000 before Christ, David. And that's the height of the kingdom. That's when things are going well. That's maybe, that's maybe where we see that kingdom that I've been talking about about before the kingdom that that we can make a contribution towards and that we long for to come into its fulfillment that's where we see the best precursor on the king david when things go i would say quite well fairly well very well except we have stories such as David murdering one of his generals and taking his wife as his own wife. And then David's son planning a revolution in the country, Absalom. And then, then. So not everything 
is is uh, perfect, but uh, there's there's lots of hope. And then after David, of course, in that period between a thousand and five hundred, we have uh, things deteriorate quite, deteriorate quite quickly. We got after David, we have his son uh, Solomon becoming becoming king, um, who is known for his wisdom. And that's something I don't fully understand why we keep. Uh, talking about Solomon's wisdom because um, he may have had wisdom in some areas, not so much in family planning. That's part of my work in Nepal, right? With with the families that we work, family planning is something that we need to talk about as something to do with development. Now, 700 wives and 300 mistresses, that to me does not sound like the absolute wisdom. You, you can make up your own mind. And sure enough, that will produce well, I don't know, if he has an average of two children per wife, that will make, well, some 2,000 princes. That's going to cause an issue, right? Who will get what? And sure enough, they end up with a divided kingdom, the north and the south, the big north and the small south, um, with, with um, kings in each part of that divided kingdom. Things do not go well in the north. Uh, where you have bad kings, invariably bad kings, and in the south, in Judah, you have some good kings, some kings that are not very good, um, and that's the next 500 years from David um, to that next big milestone, 500 before Christ, when um, Israel goes into exile. First, the northern part, they, they already go around 700 BC into exile to Assyria, um, then um, after, after maybe the last really great king, which is Hezekiah, we have still a few, a few highlights, just uh, such as Josiah, but then we have a series of not such great kings. Um, and, and eventually um, Jerusalem falls in 586 before Christ and gets completely destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar from, from Babylon after after he had installed uh, puppet kings in, in Jerusalem for several years, eventually he's got enough and he simply comes with his entire army. Um, they lay siege on Jerusalem. Um, we, we can glean most of those events, actually not so much from, from the history books in, in scripture, not so much from uh, Chronicles and Kings, but mostly from Jeremiah. Uh, we read about the siege that lasts for eight, for 17 or 18 months. That must have been absolutely brutal as the city is completely cut off and they got nothing left. And in the end, um, the, the Babylonian army uh, breaks through the walls. Um, they kill the king's sons in front of his, his eyes. Then they, they poke out his eyes, put him in shackles, and they lead away the nation of Israel into captivity. And, and the picture that you get as you read through, um, particularly in Jeremiah, is, is absolutely brutal. Um, how they plunder all the wealth that um, Israel had, everything that, that the big kings, David and Solomon, had built up is being plundered away. And so you got the Israelites um, shackled to the camels of their of their captors, of the Babylonians, trekking through the through the uh, desert. It's a 900 mile trek from Jerusalem to Babylon uh, through the desert. Um, typically, we get that from the book of Ezra. If the journey goes fast, it's a five months journey at that time. It can be longer because Ezra takes five months. And Ezra says, because God's favor was on him, it only took five months. But that gives you an idea how long that journey took on camelback. And uh, I don't think we can assume that the, the captives were going on camelback. They were, they were walking in shackles, chained to the camels, carrying the plunder that used to be their own property. Um, and, and um, there's some, some Jewish literature, not scripture, but some Jewish literature that should suggest that the sacks in which the plunder was carried, in fact, some of those sacks were made from the scrolls of Torah, from what the Hebrews held the most sacred. And in that sacks, they carry off the plunder to exile. 
Um, and when they turn back, all they see is the smoke columns of Jerusalem. Their lives are destroyed. Uh, their hope, life, it, it's just, it's gone. And so they find themselves in captivity, 500 BC. That's the next marker of history. And we'll return to that period because that's the period where Zerubbabel is located. But just as we, as we do those, those few milestones of biblical history that I hope will stay in your mind, 2000 before Christ, Abraham, 1500 before Christ, Moses and the Exodus, uh, 1000 before Christ, David, the big, great kingdom, 500 before Christ, exile. And then, of course, zero, hallelujah, Christ. Then 500 after Christ, and give or take 100 years. Hey, all of these are plus minus 100 years. 500 after Christ, in, in reality, it's, it's around 400 something, is the rise of Christendom. So, so Christianity becoming, becoming aligned with the state after 400 years of persecution uh, of Christians, now Christianity becoming accepted religion of the Roman Empire under Constantine and so on. And so now Christendom, that's the new milestone. And that's, for the, that's the, the case for the next 500 years until we hit 1000 AD. And in 1000 AD, uh, we get the great schism, of course, uh, whereby the church splits. Uh, so what, what then became known as the Catholic Church uh, and what is still known as Eastern Orthodoxy, those two split um, and we got two centers of Christianity, one in Constantinople, which is now uh, Istanbul, uh, and the other center in Rome. So we got um, two centers of Christianity and you know, if you actually analyze what that great schism was about, do, do, you, do you guys know that, what it was about? It was about whether um, for the Lord's Supper, we should, we, should leave, we should use leavened or unleavened bread. How absolutely ridiculous. Think about that. That's what caused the biggest schism in the history of Christianity, leavened or unleavened bread as a symbol of the Lord's body at, at the time of, of um, communion. Wow. And then the next big milestone, of course, 1500, the Reformation. Hallelujah. Out of that darkness of the, of the dark ages of when Christendom really, really has gone sideways, this alignment of religion and state not, not going well, um, something new and a life is coming into being through, through men like Martin Luther and, and, uh, and Zwingli and so on, the great reformers. Um, and it, well, then after 1500, if we take that next 500 step, that gets us into present day. And you guys make up your own mind. Uh, what will be maybe with the hindsight, um, with hindsight, with the benefit of history in 500 or a thousand years, and people look back, what would be the defining moment or what would it be of this era that we live in right now, this era, uh, that they would say, that's, that's what happened around 2000. Is it the end of Christendom, uh, where, where that alignment between uh, Christianity and, and political leadership has come to an end? Or is it, well, I don't know. I don't know, but we shall find out. One day we will know. Um, so this is my little, my little own way of how I uh, deal with biblical history in those 500 year steps. I hope this is helping you back to that period uh, around 500 BC. Uh, that's where Zerubbabel lives. That's when the word of the Lord comes to Zerubbabel through the prophet of Zechariah, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit. So um, Israel now is in exile. Um, huge challenges. I, I've drawn the picture for you, what they have lost, how they've lost land and, and Jerusalem, which, which stands for the promise of God. I mean, they live in the promised land and now they don't. And if you go through the biblical literature uh, about the exile, you, you can't help but feel their pain. And 
we, we may not have time to, to go into the details here, but read just Psalm 137, for instance, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat and wept. And then further down, as you scroll down in that same psalm, there's the question, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? How? How? You see, their whole life in Israel, in Jerusalem, was wrapped up in their belief in Yahweh. There was temples, there was priests, there was the Sabbath, there was all the rituals, it's all gone. Now they are in forced labor. They live in a country where they, they it, it's a foreign language. They first have to, to learn the language. So it's foreign language, it's foreign customs. Um, from my, my reading and understanding, religion wasn't such a great deal uh, for the Bab Babylonians. So it's not that, that they were in this, in this uh, place where everything was pagan. In a way, they, that was the case, but not so strongly. But, but certainly, uh, they're not in a place that's familiar to them. They're not in a place that's conducive uh, to the way they would live their life of faith. So how can we sing the songs of Zion? How can we, how can we trust in the Lord when all his promises were about, about uh, this land, this promised land, when all the history that the, the Hebrews were celebrating as you read through scriptures were about how he brought them out of Egypt and he, he divided the, the Red Sea in front of them and delivered them from their enemies. And it, it seems not to happen anymore. And then there is prophets. We read, particularly in Jeremiah, we read about false prophets that popped up, left, right, and center, saying, don't worry, it's just for a short while. Don't worry, don't get settled. We're going home anytime soon. Don't even unpack your bags. Uh, keep your hand luggage ready. And Jeremiah goes, don't listen to them. You read that in Jeremiah 27, 28, 29. Don't listen to them. Don't listen. Plant gardens. Make sure your kids marry. Um, make sure that, that you settle in the place you are. And then this absolutely astounding sentence. And pray for the city where I have put you. That city, which is the source of that great pain, which seems the enemy, which seems to be the the anti pole to everything they're holding true and, and that their faith is centered on. And pray for the city and seek its prosperity. Oh my gosh. Seek the prosperity of the city. Well, if we actually go and dig a little deeper, the word prosperity, it's, it's, it's translated as prosperity in some translation, but really um, it's a verb uh, in, in, in the uh, original language. And the best translation of the verb is shalomize the city. Uh, you understand the word shalom, the peace, this, this holistic peace that also has to do with life to the full. Seek that peace and the life to the full, the well-being of the city. Because if the city prospers, so will you. Immerse yourself. That's life in exile for the Jews. Then Jeremiah goes on. And he says, you'll be here for a while. But he hears that promise from the Lord. Um, for 70 years, you'll be here. For 70 years. Um, and that's really what we see evolve. Um, so 586 BC, um, um, the, the Hebrews get, the, the, the Israelites get um, taken away from Jerusalem and become exiles. And then 538, so that's 50 years later, um, there's a big political shift, huge. So if, if we switch for a moment uh, to the politics of the Babylonian kingdom, it, you, you can actually, there's, there's a fair amount of literature, not scripture, literature, historic literature about that period of time. And you can see how there was a shift. So in the, er the Assyrians and then the early uh, Babylonian kings, they were all about conquering lands and pulling all the people in the conquered lands um, into Babylon. Um, 
because they needed workforce. It was all about building ginormous, ginormous palaces and building their culture. They just needed workforce. And then um, just around 550 BC, this shifts. And it shifts particularly when, when Cyrus becomes the king of the, the Babylonian empire. And the thinking goes like, well, this is great that we have all this manpower, but we also need, we need cash. Um, and, and the shift is from workforce to taxation. And so um, the new conquered lands no longer get emptied of their inhabitants, but rather um, they, get, they get plundered for, for resources. And, and in fact, some of the conquered uh, territories get repopulated with their indigenous population because there's that understanding that nobody is as good as, as uh, planting and harvesting and tending the land like the people who actually have lived there for a long time. They understand how to do this. So let's put them back in and, and tax them to the hilt and have that kind of benefit. So that's the political shift. And so under Cyrus, we see a first wave. We see three big waves of returnees going back from Babylon uh, to uh, Israel. And we see that first wave um, around 538. Uh, we read about that in Ezra chapter two, uh, well, chapter one and chapter two. And I would encourage you to read about this later in your own time unless you're super familiar with that history anyways. I, I do hope I'm not boring you, eh? I, I hope this, this is shedding light on a particular era um, of scriptural history. And, and, and I hope you haven't talked about this at length over the last few weeks, I wouldn't know. Otherwise, start making noises or wave your hands or stop me or whoever has the, has the button here. You can just shut me down. That's easy to do, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to Ezra 2, you read about that. You read about King um, Cyrus and how that change of heart happens. It has to do with that big, big political shift. And then, and well, then we read for the first time about this man, Zerubbabel. Um, that's where he enters the picture in Ezra 2. So Zerubbabel is named as one of the leaders of that first wave of returnees. And all of chapter two then lists who is going back. And it, it, it's listed by, uh, by, by who are the priests and who are the people of, for each tribe and then then, and who are the descendants of Solomon and then then. And then you come to, chap, um, to chapter two verse 64 where you have a summary and the summary reads the whole company of returnees numbered 42,360 besides their 7,337 male and female slaves and they also had 200 male and female singers and they had 736 horses don't forget the horses um 245 mules 435 camels and 6,720 donkeys going back on that 900 mile trek from Persia from uh, Susa, which is the center of Babylon, uh, to, to Israel. Uh, wow, that's a lot of U-Hauls, hey, uh, if you think about it. So that's some 50,000 people and the animals. However, if you think back about what I've said maybe 15 minutes ago, that's 50,000 people. Moses, on the contrary, a thousand years earlier, had brought two million people out of Egypt into Israel. There's no growth here. We, we, we always, it, I, at least me, I'm thinking in growth. What, what's growing? Well, I'm not seeing growth. I'm seeing amazing shrinkage from 2 million to 50,000 people. And I bet you that would have been on people's mind as they relive that exodus, as they once again go towards the promised land. Um, it must feel odd. It must have felt very, very odd. And so they're on their way now um, under the leadership of another guy called uh, Shesh Bazar um, and Zerubbabel. 
So who is Zerubbabel? Who is he actually? Um, if we want to piece together things a bit more, you actually need to switch between the book of Ezra um, and Zechariah and Haggai. Uh, otherwise, we don't quite get that picture. Let's let's stay in, in Ezra for just a few more moments. If you go to chapter 3, you will then read that in the seventh month after their return, so they've just returned, they've done, probably their journey was also about seven months, um, because they were, maybe it was more, we don't have, we don't have a record of that, but at least five months, maybe something like seven months of trekking through the desert uh, with all their camels and donkeys and mules. Um, 50,000 people, they arrive in Israel. Um, Israel would not have looked very nice. I mean, this is 50 years after the destruction. Um, I have a lot of sympathy of what could have gone on in their minds as they come to Jerusalem, which has been completely destroyed, all the walls broken down, all the buildings destroyed, everything burned out. That's what they, that's what they find. Um, I've, I've traveled um, in Nepal after, after two absolutely devastating earthquakes and then helped uh, rebuild with our organization, just a very small part. And I tell you, if you get to this place where everything is destroyed, um, is this this sense of despair settling on your soul and on your heart that is really hard to fight off. So I have, when I see how the, the next part, portion of history unfolds, how there is some rebuilding and then some wavering, oh boy, I understand. It's so hard to start when there, when there is just not much to begin with. And when everything just seems like a drop in a, in a bucket, or not even a drop in a bucket, a drop in an ocean. So on the seventh, in the seventh month, uh, they still start. Um, they, they, they begin with the altar. So, so they understand that part of coming back into the land means uh, that they need to restart their, their religious life, their life of faith, and they do that. And again, we see Zerubbabel here, uh, verse 2, then Joshua, son of uh, Josadak and his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, and his associates began to build the altar of God of Israel to sacrifice burns, burnt offerings on it. So now they got the altar going. And then they go back and start, they try to build their houses, and then, then um, and now we need to flip to, to Haggai for a moment to understand what's going on next. So I'll take you to Haggai chapter 1, um, and, and I'll just read a little bit of, of that chapter to you. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah. Oh, now we learn something about him. He is governor of Judah. And let me open a small bracket here. If we actually flip forward all the way to Matthew, New Testament for a moment, you will find Zerubbabel in chapter one of Matthew, where you find what? You find the, the lineage of Jesus, the, geneal the genealogy. Zerubbabel is 10 gener 12 generations before Jesus. In other words, he's Jesus' great, 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 great grandfather. That, that's quite something to have on your CV, eh? Hey? Um, Jesus is great, 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 great grandfather. So now, by now, he is um, the governor of Judah. Um, he is in the lineage of David. So, so he is David's great, 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 great grandson, and Jesus is great, great. In other words, now think about that for a moment. In some ways, he should be king. If things had gone well, if things had not gone so terribly sideways with exile, with exile, then Zerubbabel will be king. And instead, he's stuck here with 50,000 returnees in complete destruction and quite a bit of despair. He has a title. He's now the governor of Judah. Okay. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Haggai 1. Uh, These people say, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. 
is it a time for you your do, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house the lord's house remains a ruin now this is what lord almighty says give careful thought to your ways you have planted much but harvested little you eat but never have enough you drink but never have you filled you put on clothes but are never warm you eat, you earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it wow that's interesting by extension i would say doesn't that sound familiar to you too hey we work hard and oh there's always there's always a car that's newer on craigslist and there's a house with more bedrooms out in the valley somewhere and and then and, and that sounds familiar at least to me this is what the lord almighty says give careful thought to your ways go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that i might take pleasure in it and be honored says the lord you expect much but see it turned you expected much but see it turned out to be little what you brought home i blew away why declares the lord almighty because of my house which remains a ruin while each of you is busy with his own house challenge to me challenge to me what what does it mean to build the lord's house it has something to do not with building an actual building out there somewhere but it has to do with paying attention and giving time to build that house of the lord right in here in my own heart um that's that's one that's right for me for me here and so um this is the word of the lord that Haggai has for Zerubbabel and as we go back into Ezra 3 and following chapters we see that Ezra then takes that word um seriously he takes it to heart and some months later um about in the 14th month after their return he starts building the foundation um, of the temple and so they built that foundation and if you go back to ezra it takes me a moment to flip back to, in my scripture wow this is scripture um gymnastics that we're doing this morning hey flipping between ezra and Haggai and zechariah we're now back in ezra 3 so they built the foundation it takes them not all that long maybe roughly a year to build it by now it's the it's the year 536 before christ it goes backwards right as long as we're in bc it counts down bc is backwards and there's no pun intended here with regard to the name of our province, of course, BC. O -o only the time is backwards in BC, not that easy. You know what I mean. Um, and so uh, it's now 536 uh, BC and the foundation is built. And we read in, in, uh, in, in verse uh, 10 and 11, and all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple. And there's no, there's not, not a word more said about that here in this book of history. What's going on? What is going on? So Zerubbabel did what the Lord asked of him. He returned. He was one of the 50,000 returnees. Then he, he started the altar. Then he built the foundation. There's celebration. There's great joy. The, the foundation of the new temple has been laid. Many have joined into the work. And everybody's happy except some people cry. Why? Why do they cry? And we need to go back to Haggai again uh, to get the answer. And if we do go back to Haggai, then uh, and, and you can read that uh, in your own reading, but um, then you will see that um, in verse, and I'm just trying to find it, and I don't right now. You can read it in your own time afterwards. Um, the reason is, and Haggai brings that to our attention, that the new foundation is really, really much, much smaller than the old temple used to be. And 
those who had seen the old temples, they cried because it's so puny. It looks like nothing. And, and you see, here, that's the background that, that really speaks to me. Um, so here is Zerubbabel, who could have been king in an ideal world, a king of a huge nation. It was a nation of two million people under, under Moses. It was so much more under David and Solomon. He could have been king. Now it's 50,000 people. And they're just exiles returning to ruins. They have nothing. And now they built the foundation. And it's small. It's puny. It's not much. Oh, and there's more, by the way. There's more. We read that Zerubbabel is whose son shall not heals. Right? But if you actually go and turn to do that later, if I go, if you go to First Chronicles three nineteen, then it will say that Zerubbabel is the son of Padiah, and Padiah is actually Shealtiel's brother. Oh, did we just find that one mistake in Scripture? And is it not true after all? <laughs> That's not the point here. Uh, we know Scripture is true, so so we do think. What does that mean? I'm so so glad that that um, we are allowed to think. In my upbringing, I was not so much allowed to think, by the way. Um, asking questions was uh, understood to be an expression of doubt. Um, and so we were not supposed to ask questions. But God has given me this inquisitive spirit. So what, what was I going to do with that? Eh? Uh, that's just on the side. So what's going on? First Chronicle 3.19 says that Pediah is Zerubbabel's dad. Um, scholars think that this is simply a case of a shell teal, um, Zerubbabel's dad, supposed dad, dying very early. The custom was that then the brother would, would marry his brother's widow. As we see that, for instance, with Jacob's son, sons, uh, with Tamar and so on. You're familiar with that story. Um, and so, and so while the, the lineage goes through shell teal, um, he probably was not Zerubbabel's biological father, but probably Pediah was. Oh, here's another problem for Zerubbabel, right? Another point of, of crisis in his identity. Like, who am I? I should be a king. I don't even know exactly what happened. I, I, I don't know what, what happened with my dad. It's just 50,000 people. The foundation is very small. And that's the situation into which that verse that we've been looking into really is spoken to, Zechariah 4, 6. Zechariah is wild, by the way. If you read that whole book, it's just, it's just so beautifully wild. It speaks about golden lampstands and olive trees, about the man with a measuring line, about four horns and craftsmen, about the flying scroll, about the chariots and the four horses with the four colors, which we will re-meet, by the way, in the book of Revelation. There's all kinds of talks about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But really, if you want to understand what this is all about, you have to go back to Zechariah. And then, and, 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 and. and there's that one vision in Zechariah 4, the, gold, the golden lamp stamp, lampstand. And in that vision, that verse is spoken, that word is spoken to uh, Zerubbabel. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord do Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Do you understand the message? Just 50,000 people. It's puny. It's not even a nation. It's just a few exiles. Look at, look at the smallness of that, of that new foundation. And you, not even your family is straight. The dad and so on. Not by power. It's not the size that makes it happen. It's not, it's not the power that comes in numbers. In terms of numbers, they were nothing, but it's by my spirit. And the picture, that golden lampstand, that where the light of those, it, it's a lampstand. And if, if you read through that, and there's pipes, golden pipes, through which the oil flows into the lampstand and gives fuel to, to the fire of, of the, the actual lamp or to the light. It's the oil that matters. And throughout scripture, oil is the symbol of what? 
I so wish we were in the century. I would not uh, start speaking again until, until I see hands fly up and see you yell out, it's the spirit, it's for the spirit. Of course it's for the spirit. All throughout scripture is a symbol of the spirit. You see the point being, um, the lampstand by itself does exactly, well, nothing. It's just a lighthouse without the light in it. It's, it only has value if there is light in it. By the way, we find the lampstand or the plural of lampstands again in Revelation. Now it's a scripture. It, it's a picture in scripture for the churches. And it's the very same truth. And that's the message for us. What makes a lampstand valuable? What's the point? It's the oil. It's the fuel. That's what makes the light happen. It's not its size. It's not its shininess. It's not how large the foundation of the temple is. It's not how, how well that family is doing, where not even the dad is fully clear. It's not about how big the army is. It's whether or not the oil of the spirit is flowing or not. Wow, what a message. To myself, first of all, um, I can totally hear that little voice in the back of the mind of Serapabel. I, I know that voice quite well. So I'm, I'm the captain of this little ship called Himalayan Life. And then after an earthquake, we tried to make a difference. And, and I hear the voice, Daniel, what are you doing? You're not even a relief organization. All your experience you have is working with some street kids. Well, what, what are you even up to? Uh, why do you think you can make a difference? Or I know that voice very well when it comes to family. I, I'm the son of two orphans. My mom was an orphan. My dad was an orphan. Of my four grandparents, uh, I've, none, I've known none of them. Um, but we know who my dad's mom is. That's all we know. We don't know who my mom's parents are. We don't know who my, da who my dad's dad is. We only know who my dad's mom is. Meaning, my name is Daniel Berkey. It's not even my name. The name should come from my dad's dad, right? It's not even my name. I don't know who I am. Uh, in a way, no, no, uh, please, please take this with a grain of salt. I actually, I, I really rejoice in my identity as a child and servant and friend of God. So I, I feel, I, I don't have huge issues with that, but my sister does. One of my sisters really do. Um, she really struggles with lack of identity. And I think that verse uh, can or should maybe does speak to her, not by power nor by mind, but by, by my spirit. And sometimes when I hear people talk about their, their ancestry and how they did their family research and their family too, I go like, mm. Yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> Doesn't really resonate with me, for sure not. And so you see how for me personally, so I'm just reflecting here, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit. Wow, there's quite the message in there. But I think there's a message for all of us. Um, we all long, we all long for that kingdom of God, for those promises to be fulfilled. I think it was the same for Zerubbabel and the returnees. They lived out of those promises that were given to them in, in Isaiah, in Jeremiah, in the other prophets. Um, those promises about, about uh, Jerusalem and Israel's glory being restored and so on. And even Haggai talks about that. Haggai chapter 1, I think at the end, uh, talks about this new temple whose foundation is tiny, puny. That the glory is going to be greater than the old, the big temple's glory. So there's that, there's that hope in all of us. There's the hope that, that in Latner, through, through Latner Gospel Assembly, God will do something great and does something great. And sometimes we feel small. I'm sure you sometimes feel that way. And that's the word of the Lord for all of us this morning. Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In other words, we better make sure, we better make sure that those pipes uh, that bring the oil of the Spirit into the lampstand, that they are clear and unclogged, because otherwise we are really in trouble. 
if we don't have the power, nor the might, nor the spirit, oh, then we're in trouble. Then there's not much left. So we better make sure. That's why um, in my own prayer, in my, in my own faith, I, I start pretty much every day with a very simple prayer, Lord, today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit afresh, because without it, I, I can't do this. I, I can't walk by the Spirit until you put that Spirit in me again today. I want to be uh, walking as your son. Uh, I want to be a light of the world. I can only do it if once again, today, you fill me with your Spirit and help me make this happen. Sarah, I, I hope this message for you has given a new perspective on, on this man, Zerubbabel, in his own time, uh, in his period of time, where things with exile and so on weren't going particularly great. Now, by extension, we could say there's a little bit of exileness to the present day with, with, um, with what we're experiencing, with the pandemic, we're a little bit in exile. Now, we have Zoom. Zerubbabel didn't have Zoom, but other than that, we will be quite isolated today. We can't go to our sanctuaries. We can't sing the songs we want to sing. We can't even do it on Zoom because Facebook will shut us down or something. I just, I just gathered from Ray before. There's a bit of exileness about us too. And, and um, well, we have to work that out just as Zerubbabel and his fellows did have to work it out. Things and I'll, I'll, I'll just end with that. See, things didn't go all that great after Zerubbabel. You will know that after that first wave of returnees, there was a second wave of returnees coming uh, a, a few years later with Ezra, the priest. And then Nehemiah brought the third wave of returnees. And that's when chronologically and historically the Old Testament ends. The last scene we get from the Old Testament in terms of its history is the last chapter of the book of Nehemiah. It already starts during Zerubbabel's time when um, on the Zerubbabel's uh, attempts for rebuilding, uh, the work gets stalled because there's opposition. And then, very interesting, some of the other inhabitants of the land and to the best of our understanding, we're actually talking here, uh, that's Ezra 4, we're actually talking about, about their fellow Hebrews from the northern kingdom. So that would be what in the New Testament are called the Samaritans. They say, can we please help build that new temple? And Zerubbabel and later Ezra and then Nehemiah turns, turn them down and say, nope. You have no, you have no part in this. You're not, you're not holy enough. That's essentially the message. You're not holy enough. And in the same chapter, they discover, Ezra discovers that there's that whole intermarriage thing going on, whereby the, the, the Israelites had intermarried with the pagan nations around them. There's all kinds of confusion and it ends in chaos. The picture ends with Ezra and then later Nehemiah actually beating up people. That's the last picture we get in the whole in the Old Testament, uh, punching, punching fists, punching people in their face, pulling out their beards. I don't have a beard. I don't know what that would feel like, but I, I would I would imagine that it, this is painful, uh, and it ends in big chaos. This is almost like like if if Mr. Horgan. And, and Dr. Bonnie Henry would start going to the parks and beating up people for trespassing against uh, the, um, uh, the, health, the health regulations. Now, that would be chaos, wouldn't they be? But that's how it ends. Um, and, and what that highlights to my mind is the sheer need for Jesus Christ, for the Messiah to come um, and redeem all of this and, and bring and bring all of this together, not by power, nor by might, um, and even not through that little effort that I can bring, um, but by the Spirit. That's the message here. And Jesus, of course, comes and 
He's filled with the Holy Spirit and he can make it and he does make it happen in a way that neither Zerubbabel, nor Ezra, nor Nehemiah, nor Daniel, I can do anything. And that's, that's the good news in all of that in which we really, really rejoice. And I think I have used up my time. I have no idea how much time I had. I used it anyways, but nobody shut me down. So that's good. I hope this is a blessing to you, not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And when there is doubt, where there is question, questions, whether what we do is too small to count, then I think, remember the name Zerubbabel, uh, how he in his situation, simply by being an instrument for the spirit of the Lord, actually did make a difference. And the prophecy that Haggai had, that the new temple would be more glorious than the old temple, of course it became true. How? Because Jesus walked in it and preached in it and taught in it and healed in it. It's the temple where finally that big earthquake happened and the, 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 the curtain was torn apart and that new kingdom of grace was ushered in. And I stop here. Thank you very much. Back to you, um, Ray. Thank you, Daniel. <clears throat> Thank you for your encouraging words. Uh, in a time of difficulty, when COVID is running rampant on us, <clears throat> it is so good to know that the Lord is in charge. <clears throat> I chose as a closing song today, the words to great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Uh, he talks about in whom we have the victory. I think, Daniel, of your work in uh, Himalayan life, and I see what you're doing over there, and it seems small, and yet you're making a tremendous difference in the lives of little people, in the lives of the people on the street, in the lives of young children being educated. And this is all due to the Spirit of God working through you. Um, the words to this song are thanks for working in our lives, and we trust in his unfailing love. Uh, Jeremy, I, I hope you can get that song um, uh, in just a minute. Just a uh, reminder for the uh, little praise session we're going to have tonight with Guy Penrod at 630. We'll be here on Zoom and please join us. It will bless your heart. Let's just take a moment to close in prayer. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Father, for putting in the heart of Daniel uh, Berge to work in Nepal with, along with Karina and the tremendous work they do there. But thank you for his vision in bringing the word of God today through Zerubbabel, not by power nor by might, but by my spirit. Sometimes we look to big things. We appreciate big things. We look at big churches and we think they've got it all together. But we thank you that you are faithful and it's your spirit that makes a difference. It's the change in people's lives as they come to faith in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the way in which you work in our lives. We thank you that you are worthy to be praised. And we give you thanks for our Lord Jesus in his precious and worthy name. Amen. <clears throat> um, 